what is the difference between British and American humour? A lot of people out there believe it's down to optimism and pessimism. Many think that naturally Americans are more hopeful, so as a result their media is more happy. And the British are, well, miserable, so uh, we like to see the world burn, which is reflected in how often sad and dark a lot of our media is. Now there is some truth to that, but if you were to ask me, that's only scratching the surface, and while it is correct, it's only a fragment of a larger picture, and it's kind of misleading, because using that logic, American people are more happy than the British are, but according to a 2018 census by the UN, the happiness levels in the UK and the US are almost identical. In fact, they're so similar, they're ranked dead next to each other when compared to every other country in the world. So when people say that the difference in humour is because America is more happy than Britain, well, it's just not true. Because nowadays, we're all as depressed as each other. That was British humour right there. Quite dry, pessimistic and self-deprecating. Where the victim of the joke is myself, the joke teller as I say it. Now in the UK, if you make a joke similar to that about, for example, how bad your grades are at school, it would probably be received with quite a few laughs. But if you made the exact same joke in America, a lot of people might be genuinely worried and think that you lack confidence in yourself. Some wouldn't even recognise that you're making a joke at all. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It it just highlights the difference between the two cultures, but I think a great place to start off and break down how they're so different is by comparing the average British sitcom and the average American sitcom, and there really are some very interesting differences. One of the biggest is in how almost all British comedies, it ends in disaster. Take Faulty Towers or Blackadder for example, two of the most popular British comedies ever made. Every single episode of both of those shows, without exception, ends in total disaster. The protagonist will have a task, he will try to complete that task, and just when all seems well, everything goes horribly wrong, and it ends with, quite frankly, an unhappy ending. For example, in one episode of Faulty Towers, there's a health inspector having a look at the hotel, all the while there's a rat on the loose and the staff are trying to catch it, and after a huge amount of effort and shenanigans and some very close calls, they finally catch the rat and all is well, except the last shot of the episode is the protagonist is pulling off the lid of the biscuit tin to the inspector for the rat to be munching on the biscuits, leaving the audience to imagine what kind of awful consequences are going to happen. Or in Blackadder, where one episode he has to rat out a German spy in the field hospital. There's a German spy in the hospital, and it's my job to find him. And all seems well. In the end, he's caught the spy and she's off to be shot by firing squad without a trial, except just at the last moment, it's revealed that there was no spy, it was all just a misunderstanding, and Blackadder just sent an innocent nurse off to be executed. And the final moments are of him learning that alongside his fellow officer who hates him, as they both dash off to tell the commander, leaving us all to imagine what dire consequences Blackadder is going to face. I mean, the very last episode of Blackadder ends with all the characters going over the top, and dying. I mean, it doesn't get much more depressing than that. But when you look to the other side of the Atlantic, you do see more hopeful shows. It's quite common for American sitcoms to end happily, for there to be a great emotional catharsis to not so much leave the audience laughing in tears like the British do, but rather more inclined to leave the audience with actual tears. For example, in The American Office, Michael and Dwight are two characters who have a very bitter, hate-filled relationship, except when Michael leaves the show, he leaves Dwight with a letter of recommendation, and this happens. To whom it may concern. Good, real personal. Thanks, Michael. The dictionary defines superlative as of the highest kind, quality, or order. I define it as Dwight Schrute. As a sales executive, as a man, and as a friend, he is of the highest kind, quality, supreme. And the character realises in that moment just how much he grossly underestimated how much Michael means to him, and it creates this powerful revelation that brings the audience to tears. There is nothing wrong with that approach to comedy. Futurama is a cartoon comedy, you wouldn't expect there to be these heartwarming moments that bring the audience to tears, but a huge amount of episodes tug at the heartstrings. For example, Fry becomes a master musician with a fictional instrument, and becomes beloved by the public, but when he loses his talent at the end of the episode, everyone leaves his concert except for one. Please don't stop playing, Fry. I want to hear how it ends.
and then his girlfriend stays behind and watches his performance. Because she truly doesn't care how talented a player he is, she only cares about making him happy. That is a really satisfying ending, and you could bet that if Futurama were a British comedy, that episode would have ended in total disaster where even his girlfriend left him in the end. American comedy is just more happy than British comedy, and that's no real secret. And from a certain way of thinking, it's a flaw with British comedy, as characters are often denied that ability to be real, to create genuine emotion in the audience. The IT crowd is a very funny British comedy, but I just can't imagine one of those characters having a serious heart to heart with one another. They just aren't given that chance. Now it's one thing to talk about how the two styles of comedy are different, but in this video I want to do something more. I want to address a side of the argument that has never been really talked about. I want to try and explain why they're different. Why Americans enjoy happy shows and why the British don't so much. And if you ask me, humour is a construct of culture. The culture of a country has a massive effect on the sense of humour that country has. And few things affect culture more than the news. Now this next bit is no great social theory or proven idea, it's just my own opinion, so take it as you will, but in my opinion, one of the biggest things that affects the fact Americans prefer their media to be happy is because of the news, or more specifically, because the news in the USA is so dark and fearful. It's no secret to anybody that the news is just a constant battering ram of fear mongering. If you want to be terrified, there's never ending coverage that can make you scared shitless. Now it's no secret that there is a massive fundamental difference between the news in the UK and the news in the US, and in my opinion it's a difference so important that it actually affects the taste in media those two cultures have. When you actually sit down in England to watch the evening news, you realise something. It's cold. They will address the day's news in a detached way. The anchor will read out the news emotionless from the teleprompter, almost like a very good text-to-speech program, and will never directly say their own opinion to the audience. That's something you would be, well, let's say, hard-pressed to find in US news. They will rarely sensationalise stories, and to be honest, watching the news in the UK is kind of boring. The thing about the BBC News is, like it or hate it, it's state-funded, which means two important things. They're non-profit, and thusly, they don't run ads. The people telling the news on TV in the UK are not incentivised to make money. They really don't care how many people tune in and watch every day. However, in the US, it's the exact opposite. When you look at CNN, Fox and all the other news providers, they are private companies. Above all else, they want to make money, so they run ads. The number of viewers they have directly links to how much money they earn, so those news sources are heavily incentivised to sensationalise the news, to in all respects make the people afraid, because when the people are afraid, what do they do? They watch the news even more, which means those companies earn much more money. As a great example, you can look at how back in 2014, the Ebola virus was starting to spread, and it was a big worry for many people. Here is how that viral outbreak was covered in the UK. Hundreds of British troops are being sent to West Africa. A small number of cases will reach the UK. We can contain it. Britain is at the forefront of preventing the spread. A message for the public, don't worry. And here is how that exact same story. In the USA, in a country just as well equipped to stop a viral outbreak as the UK, was covered. Fox News alert now, the Ebola emergency here in America. The killer virus. Spreading much faster than efforts to contain it. Spiraling out of control. Stop admitting West Africans into America right now. Oh, hell is about to break loose. <laughs> the difference is uncanny. And the reason why is really quite simple. If you're worried about something, you switch on the news and they say everything is fine, don't worry about it, then you'll probably switch off and go do something else. But if the news is saying that everything is spiralling out of control and heavily implying that that deadly virus will be at your front door soon, and because you keep watching, you spend more time watching their adverts, which means more money goes into their pockets. 
you know, immigrants are trying to take your job and pedophiles are trying to fuck your kids and terrorists are coming to blow up your Ford Focus in particular. Now, this all comes back to comedy, to why Americans enjoy happy movies and happy comedies so much more than the British do. And my theory is that it's all a result of that culture, of that, well, fear culture. Because due to the rather, well, intentionally toxic messages American news spreads, it makes the people more fearful, more distrusting, more paranoid, but in the UK that kind of news coverage is so much more rare, and that results in the American people having a proclivity to escapism. They want to lose themselves in the happy fantasy of their media. To escape from that culture of fear, the news works so hard to create. And I think what's quite interesting on that point is the straight man. He or she is a character in comedy where they are totally normal. When every other character is stupid or naive or has a massive ego or any other character flaw, that straight man has no flaws. Very often you'll see this take the form of the wisecracker, someone who is always incredibly witty, always has some clever one liner or something funny to say, and there is no better example of the wisecracker than in Seinfeld. The protagonist Seinfeld is a near perfect character and he fills that role of the wisecracker like a glove. Name please. Uh, Seinfeld, uh, you made a reservation for a mid-size and she's a small. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding around of course. Unfortunately we ran out of cars. But the reservation keeps the car here. That's why you have the reservations. <laughs> I know why we have reservations. I don't think you do. <laughs> In Seinfeld, the protagonist is exceptionally witty. He always has something clever to say, and this comes back to the whole notion of the straight man. The idea of that character in comedy who is normal and has no big character flaws, where the butt of the joke is not him, but more so the people around him. And it's a pretty common trope in American comedies, for example, Michael in Arrested Development, where everyone in his family is seemingly insane except for him. Wait, no, why does everybody think that I'm scared of girls? Because you're a chicken. Cuckoo ka cha! Cuckoo ka cha! Yeah. What are you doing? Michael yeah. and women? A coodle do that. That's what I was Has anyone in this family yeah. ever even seen a chicken? But in British comedies, such a character is very rare. Now, there are exceptions on both sides. For example, Parks and Recreation is an American comedy with no real straight man. Everyone in that show is flawed. For example, Leslie, the woman who is desperately naive. April, the intern who's nihilistic and hates everyone. Ron, the guy who is. Uh, okay, I have no clue how to describe Ron Swanson. Hi, my Yorkshire Terrier has chewed up the legs on my kitchen table. Is there a cheap way to repair that? Great question. Ditch the Terrier and get yourself a proper dog. Any dog under 50 pounds is a cat and cats are pointless. And that straight man trope is one that's pretty popular in America, and it's pretty rare in Britain, and I think that's an extension of that escapism. As Stephen Fry once excellently put it, The American comic hero is a wisecracker who is above his material and who is above the idiots around him. All the great British comic heroes are people who want life to be better and on whom life craps from a terrible height and whose sense of dignity is constantly compromised by the world letting them down. In a sense, comedy is the microcosm that allows us to examine the entire difference between our two cultures. The thing about a straight man is that they are more than just a character. They do more than just create comedy because in a sense, they're a vessel for the audience to project themselves onto. On a subconscious level, when you see a wisecracker saying funny one-liners and putting customer service people into their place, on a subconscious level the audience projects themselves onto their character, which assists in that escapism. And that example of Seinfeld tearing apart the customer service, I think it's a wonderful reflection of that idea. Everyone has had crappy experiences with customer service, but in this scene, Seinfeld does what we all wish we had done. With witty comebacks, he essentially destroys the employee's dignity and outlines in great detail why they They've done their job wrong. So you know how to take the reservation, you just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's really the most important part of the reservation. Anybody can just take them. 
Again, there is nothing wrong with that style of comedy, as it is just that, a style of humour that's no worse or better than the others. But what do you think? Am I right? Or is the real difference between British and American comedy something else entirely? I'd love to know what you think in the comments down below. So today I want to end this video on a note that hits quite close to home. And that note is internet security. So NordVPN has very kindly sponsored today's video, and honestly I couldn't be happier, because it's one of the few services out there that I would and have recommended to friends and family. And that service is what myself and many respected reviewers are calling the best VPN you can get. In fact, their service has helped me so much as long as they have it, I know I will never stop using it. And well, why is a service like NordVPN so important to have? Well, the simple truth is that nowadays, if you are someone who values your privacy and security online, you need a good VPN. What NordVPN does is it uses military grade encryption on all your coming and going information to your PC, laptop, phone and tablet, so if there are any prying eyes looking at your information, it will be encrypted and they will have no clue what you're doing or what you're looking at. When you connect to public Wi-Fi, you are incredibly vulnerable to having your information stolen, but with NordVPN, that just isn't a problem. The reason why I will never stop using a VPN is because a year ago I had an encounter with a quote unquote fan who liked my content so much he discovered my private information, my full name that not even my close friends know, he found out the town where I live, he found out the various schools I went to as a child and then after sending me a series of uncomfortably friendly messages, I cut off all contact with him, and he DDoSed me. Which to oversimplify, when you get DDoSed your internet gets overloaded and you physically can't use it. This guy, who was a total stranger, had such control over my life that he could with just the flick of a switch shut down my internet for as long as he wanted, and he did just that for a full two weeks, until thankfully he got bored and gave up the attacks. In in those two weeks, I couldn't play games, I couldn't watch YouTube or Netflix, but most importantly, I couldn't do my job. In fact, I'm pretty sure I told you guys in my other video that it got so bad at one point, I had to go down to Starbucks just so I could upload a video. It was the most nerve-wracking, terrifying experience I have ever had while being online. And it was a situation that could have been totally avoided if I used a VPN. Because a VPN disguises your information and IP address, giving you some seriously big teeth to defend yourself from such attacks. And that is just one story. That is just one reason why you should get a VPN. And as I said earlier, if you care about your privacy and security online, then in this day and age, having a VPN is an absolute requirement. Trust me, I had to learn that the hard way. So if you care about your privacy and security online, then please use the URL nordvpn.com forward slash the closer look, or at the checkout use the code the closer look and you'll get 77% off. Really, it's a service that in my opinion, for the price it is, especially with my discount code, it is an absolute steal. Again, if you're interested, please use the URL nordvpn.com forward slash the closer look, or use the code the closer look with no spaces at the checkout and get yourself protected today. There is a link in the top of the description if you want to click on it. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.